pointed out what should have been obvious to us, which well, ridiculously wasn't obvious to us, but should have been, that the whole document is in Moses Maimonides' handwriting. So he document. wrote the document. He wrote it. He wrote this list. This is the Rambam one. Amazing. Welcome to Kedem channel and today I am very delighted and glad to be in uh, one of the interesting one of the interesting rooms in the Cambridge University with uh, Dr. Benjamin uh, Alf Waite and uh, he is the head of the Cairo Geniza uh, Geniza Research Unit. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. And there are rumors that uh, we have in this uh, room quite a few findings which can uh, really change our understanding of the past. Yeah, yeah. The, the Jewish community of Cairo have known about the existence of, of, of the Geniza since they first started using it. And they were still using it in the 19th century when Solomon Schechter, who then was a Cambridge scholar, arrived, um, was introduced to the you know, chief rabbi of Egypt, and the chief rabbi you know, showed him this great storeroom um, which we don't really know exactly what it looked like or how big it was, but he was shown to this old synagogue in Al Fustat in the heart of Old Cairo, in, um, you know, the earliest part of um, the, the, the original Islamic capital of Egypt. And he was shown this storeroom and invited to take away whatever he liked. And famously, he said, I liked it all. And he carried away the contents of this room back to Cambridge in uh, 1897, 1898. And so it's been sat, most of the Cairo Geniza collection, so the contents of this storeroom, has been sat in Cambridge for 100 years. Um, the Geniza Research Unit, of which I'm now the head, and which was started by my predecessor, Professor Stefan Reif, um, has been working uh, full-time on this collection, solely on this collection since the 1970s, since 1973-74. And we are still, you know, halfway through the kind of task of, 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 of digging into it and finding what's there. And if you come at any time, so if you came a few years ago and asked me what's the most exciting thing that we found, I would probably talk to you about some of the biblical stuff we found because the Bible, you know, there's a feeling that the, the Bible in the Middle Ages isn't very interesting. You know, when you have the Dead Sea Scrolls, where, which are sort of date from the time that the Bible was still being put together, you know, kind of canonically assembled, that's really interesting because that's like seeing, you know, the way that it was happening. Um, but in actual fact, if you think about, you know, who wrote the Aleppo Codex, who wrote Codex Leningrad, these people were living in and around Egypt and Palestine in the 10th and 11th centuries. And our collection, the Cairo Geniza, the contents of this storeroom, um, uh, uh, is all the material from that age and from those people. And so we have, you know, in amongst our collection, Bibles, leaves of great Bibles, every bit as good as the Aleppo Codex, produced, you know, by the masters of their art in that time. At the same time, though, where we, we're, we're, we're different from our collections is we have all the manuscripts that were never intended to be saved for posterity. So the Aleppo Codex was obviously written, you know, the greatest Bible was written by the leading Masoret of his day, the leading scribe of his, of his city. Um, it was owned by the highest members of Jewish society and it got passed down and passed down and eventually, you know, was the, the prized treasure of the Aleppo synagogue. Um, however, that's only kind of 0.1% of the Bible manuscripts that must have circulated in the Middle Ages. Um, and, you know, every, every member of the community who could would want a Bible. And it's the duty of every Jew to, at least once in his lifetime, copy a Bible. That's what Maimonides says. Um, and if you can't, if you don't have the skill to copy it yourself or the time, then you pay someone to do it for you. So, you know, kings and rulers can pay someone. Ordinary people have to scribble it on a bit of, you know, scrap paper. And so what we have in the Geniza is all of these range of Bibles from, from the people who could barely write, but still wanted something to put on their lap in the synagogue, um, all the way up to, you know, scribes who are every bit as good as Samuel Ben Jacob, who wrote Codex Leningrad or, or, um, um, or, you know, of, of the quality of the sort of scribes of the Aleppo Codex. Now, on the other hand, though, in addition to Bibles, copies of the Mishnah, Talmud, all the sorts of things that you would expect to be stored in a sacred storeroom, so manuscripts that are precious because they're holy, so Kitve Kodesh, um, but, and so they can't be thrown away when they come to the end of their life. They are, uh, you know, maybe, you know, like Torah scrolls, great big things that you roll and unroll. They, they break down the seams and you can repair them and you can repair them and you can rewrite sections and you can carry on doing that, but eventually it will be too old to use. 
um, and you can't just sling that out um, because it's a holy object. You're supposed to bury it. That is the you know the, the rules of Geniza are set out in a few places in the Mishnah and, and discussed in the Talmud and so on. Um, but before you bury it, you place it in uh, in uh, in a cupboard or in a room where it can't be misused or profaned, as they say. So somebody can't cut bits of it up to use as amulets, or they can't write you know a shopping list on the back of it. Um, and so those items you expect to find in the Geniza, and we have you know countless items like that. But what's surprising about Solomon Schechter's discovery when he went to this room and took away what he thought were Kitve Kodesh um, was the extent to which he found manuscripts that have no obvious holy content. So they are um, products of a medieval pen, um, you know, written in the 10th and 11th centuries, but they are not for a religious purpose. So and that's where we have you know, all the poetry, the shopping list, the personal letters, and so on. And it's in amongst that kind of material that we find some of the most exciting things. The oldest documents in the Geniza, uh, to what period can you date them? What's interesting about the Geniza is that the, the synagogue in which these manuscripts were found, um, the building as it now stands dates from the 1040s, so the 11th century. But it was rebuilt on the same foundations of an old, as an older synagogue, because there was a synagogue before then that was destroyed by the Caliph al-Hakim, the Fatimid Caliph al-Hakim, who persecuted Jews and Christians during his reign, or during part of his reign. And he destroyed the synagogue. Um, as soon as he disappeared into the desert, you know, probably murdered by his relatives, the Jewish community got permission to rebuild the synagogue. And that synagogue, although it's fallen down and been rebuilt and remodeled and even recently was renovated, still exists today and is still a synagogue. Um, however, we don't know when it was first built. And what's most interesting is that we have many manuscripts in the collection that are much earlier than the synagogue, which kind of makes sense because if you think um, a Bible, you know, or a Torah scroll, paying a scribe to copy it, buying all of the sheepskins necessary to make it, that's very expensive. And we know in the Middle Ages not every community could afford a Torah scroll. We have evidence in the Geniza that says exactly that. Some communities have to read from a book because they cannot afford a scroll. Um, so when you have a Torah scroll, you're going to look after it and keep it for a long period of time. And so what you would expect that in the Geniza is the earliest items we have are probably Torah scrolls because those are the sorts of things that a community would keep using for you know, hundreds of years if possible. You know, in, and, and old books generally, you know, even I don't collect books and yet even I probably in, at home have books that are you know, one or two hundred years old. Um, and so if you look at, uh, at the manuscripts in our collection and you look at some of our oldest Torah scrolls, we do have ones that are very old. So we have a piece of one that has other parts in other collections and one of those other collections has carbon dated it. We don't carbon date manuscripts here because it involves cutting a piece off and burning it and we don't allow the destruction of any of our material. Um, however, they, in a different collection they have done this and they've dated that Torah scroll, which is a section of the book of um, Exodus, I think, to 700 CE, so that's 8th century. So that's really early, I mean that's hundreds of years earlier than the synagogue and, and um, is one of the earliest known Torah scrolls apart from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, you know, from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the earliest books of the Bible, there is a big, there's sort of felt to be a gap. But that gap can be filled by manuscripts that we have in the Geniza that if we, if we only knew how old they were, and in this case we do because it's been carbon dated. Now we have other, other Torah scrolls that are like that one that we think are old, and uh, Targum scrolls as well, so we think 7th, 8th century are some of the oldest. But in actual fact, those are not the oldest items we have because before the arrival of paper in Egypt, so paper comes you know, through the Islamic world, from China originally, through the Islamic world, makes its way to Egypt by the 10th century already. And by the end of the 10th century, beginning of the 11th century, it's widely available. They're making it locally in Egypt, they're making it in Syria, even making it in, in Eretz Israel, in Palestine. Um, and so everybody can actually start to write in a way that perhaps they couldn't before because parchment, cloth or gvil is expensive. Um, and so as soon as paper arrives, um, uh, we have an explosion of writing and it's possible for people really to, you know, write everyday ordinary things and, you know, if they make a mistake to throw that away and, you know, start again. 
But before the arrival of paper, people in the Geniza world, well, they would have used papyrus, but that's very early and we don't really have evidence of that in the Geniza because that's the, the classical sort of late antique period. And we, do, we really go back, only back to the early Middle Ages. They used parchment for everyday writing, for, for their writings. And so with the, one of the particular things about parchment, and this is common to all the communities that use parchment, so Christians and Jews especially, is that as a writing material, one, it's expensive, but two, you can erase it. Um, and that's what we call a palimpsest. If you erase a parchment and you write over the top of it, and in Christian communities, it's famous, so St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai famously got cut off from the world many times when uh, Muslim invasions and various other things. And they went through difficult periods. And during those periods, the monks still had to do what monks do, which is write books. Mm -hmm. And so they went to their library and they said, well, what are the oldest books we have in the library that we don't use anymore? So they, they took the oldest books, they scraped the writing off because you can remove a layer of skin and you can wash it and scrape it. And they wrote new texts over it. And that's what we call a palimpsest. And they, they cannibalized their own library. Now, the Jewish community wouldn't do the same thing because you cannot take an old Bible and scrape off the words of God. I mean, that would be a, that would be a mortal sin because you're, you're supposed to preserve. You know, the whole point of a Geniza is to stop people doing that kind of thing. But what you can do is you can go to the market and you can buy other people's holy books and you can scrape that off. And so the earliest manuscripts we have in the Geniza are actually Christian. And they're the undertext of palimpsests. And they're from some of the famous monasteries of the Holy Land. So Masaba, for instance, like one of the great monasteries of the Holy Land, beautiful, you know, hanging monastery in the Kidron Valley. They had a scriptorium there that produced books in, well, originally in um, Christian Palestinian Aramaic. So the Aramaic used by Jews, uh, but used by early Christians. Um, and in the languages of some of the monks who lived there, like Georgian. And at certain points after the Islamic uh, invasion of the Holy Land, and um, their libraries got pillaged or sold off, and pages ended up in the market. And those, some of them were bought by Jews who, who needed to write books, but could, you know, there was a limit to how much they could afford to buy um, you know, new parchment. So they bought, where possible, older parchment, they cleaned and they washed it and they wrote. And, 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 and so what we have in the Geniza, and it's, 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 it's a very interesting case because this was some of the first things to be discovered from the Geniza, um, are pages from a few early books used by the Jewish community, um, Talmud, Midrashim, and a lot of pages of a machzor of the poet Yanai, um, which if you peer underneath the Hebrew, and the Hebrew is early, the, the Hebrew is at least 10th century, maybe earlier, if you peer underneath it, you can see the Greek writing and Georgian writing and Christian Palestinian Aramaic writing underneath. So the earliest manuscripts that we can date in the Geniza date from about the 5th or the 6th Christian century, so, so CE. Um, but they've been accidentally entombed in the Geniza, Geniza because they've been reused for Jewish writings. And they're kind of characteristic of the early history of the Geniza as well, because the Kara Geniza arrived in Cambridge. Solomon Schechter, you know, a Jewish scholar working in Cambridge, an unusual thing um, in those days, because Cambridge was a factory for producing Anglican priests. Solomon Schechter um, brought the manuscripts back to Cambridge, where there wasn't really an audience for a massive Jewish collection. He was the audience for it. And he sat, you know, a lonely vigil in the library, working through these boxes of scattered bits of paper and parchment, making extraordinary discoveries every day. But some of the scholars who worked in Cambridge, strongly Christian, were interested in copies of the Greek Bible, copies of the Bible generally. So the first manuscripts to be published from the Cairo Geniza, apart from Schechter's own discoveries, were these palimpsests. And they published the undertext. So they said, you know, what we have here is the earliest known copy, in fact, the only known complete um, sole copy of Aquila's translation of the Bible. So Aquila, originally a Jewish translation, is, is, it, it was used by both Jews and, and Christians. Or Oregon's Hexapla, which was this critical edition of the Bible produced by Oregon, great, great thinker of the early church. Um, that those discoveries are of essential importance for the history of Christian, uh, of the Christian Greek Bible. But it wasn't until a decade later or so that um, other scholars, 
Jewish scholars looked at those publications and they said, yes, all well and good that, you know, this is the earliest copy of the Greek Bible that we have, you know, it's that kind of thing. Oregon's takes up a unique discovery, fantastic. But the text that's written over the top of it is the lost poems of the poet Yenai, um, who at the time of the Kyrogenesis discovery was reputed to be the most famous um, poet of the Palestinian synagogue in late antiquity, early middle ages, because he was regarded as the most prolific. His reputation was great, but in the days of the discovery of the Genesis at the end of the 19th century, there was not one single complete poem by Yenai in the Jewish record. Um, there were three pieces of his poems in different copies of, of the prayer book. So used by different rites, so different little bits of Yenai. And if you look, if you want to know what the world would be like without the Cairo Geniza, then you just have to look at the, the Jewish encyclopedia that was published between sort of 1904 or whatever and 1909. That was the product of the great Wissenschaft des Judentums movement. Uh, so the greatest scholars of Germany and America, you know, put their heads together and said, let's write a scientific encyclopedia of everything we know about Judaism using all the latest methods of research. And they did that. And it's fantastic, you know, 12 volumes. Um, and the great irony is that they were doing that. They were actually writing that. At the same time, Solomon Schechter was in Egypt, completely changing the history of Judaism. Because when they wrote about Moses Maimonides, you know, they didn't have, they didn't know that they had a single piece of writing actually by him, you know, in his own handwriting, for instance. If you read the entry for the poet Yanai, written by, I think, Chaim Blanc, I can't, no, no, Chaim Brody, I think. Um, it actually says, by reputation, the greatest synagogue poet, um, we have three pieces of his poetry. The extant poems do not show any great poetic talent or artistic talent. Right? It, that's pretty typical for the Wissenschaftler's Unterms, you know, that they, they're a bit snooty about what they're studying as well. But to say that the greatest poet of the, of the early Palestinian synagogue was not a very good poet, based on the fact that you've read three small pieces of his poetry. At the same time, Solomon Schechter was in Egypt recovering hundreds and hundreds of Yanai's lost poems. But of course, we didn't know that until Israel Davidson looked at the publication of these Greek manuscripts and realized that the poems written above had in the, uh, in the in, if you look at the edge of the text, right? So it, it's a beautiful muscle, a lovely, lovely prayer book of Yanai's poetry. Um, and if you look at the edge, you can see that there are acrostics. So the beginnings of lines start with meaningful words. And you can read the name Yanai, Yanai, spelt in the original spelling of Yud, Nun, Yud, Yud, not Aleph, Yud, which is the Babylonian spelling of his name. But he was a Palestinian, he spelled it Yud, Yud. Um, and you can see that these are Yanai's poems. They're copies of them produced in the 10th century, maybe earlier. And it's a beautiful book of his poetry for every reading in the liturgical year. So the bits, so written over the top of the Greek Bible, we have those bits of Leviticus, which, you know, are poems about mold on walls and, and that kind of stuff, you know. He wrote poems even for those bits of Leviticus. And that's why he was regarded as greatest poet of the Palestinian synagogue, because he produced so much poetry. But it was all entirely lost. But now we have, you know, I don't know what percentage we now have of his poems, but we've got a huge amount. And if you want to ask, well, why are beautiful Mahsorim of Yanai's poetry being essentially thrown away into a sacred storeroom because they're not used anymore. Well, one is the books may have fallen apart, which is possible. Um, but, you know, truly valuable books you keep, you know, like the Aleppo Codex. The Aleppo Codex probably, you know, would definitely suffered damage over the years, but, you know, it's remained as a book. Um, people have looked after it and repaired it and so on. Why are these Maksorim, which were evidently the, the, you know, the product of a scribe's months and months of work and expensive books to produce, why were they put into the Geniza? Well, there is, a, there is a good reason for that. One is that Yanai was a poet of the Palestinian synagogue and um, the liturgy of the Palestinian synagogue um, died out in the Middle Ages. And so at certain points, especially first in Palestine and then even in Egypt, the Jewish community stopped praying the traditional Palestinian way and started paying, praying according to the Babylonian rite, which was where you read the whole Torah through in one year. But originally in Palestine, they read the Torah through in, in three or three and a half years. And if you read it through in three and three and a half years, you, 
you, you read smaller pieces, so you read a seder rather than a, a parasha, um, and you therefore need different peel team to sing around the, uh, the reading of the Torah in the synagogue. And so Yanai's peel team were fitted to the three-year cycle of, of, of reading the Torah. And when they stopped reading the Torah with three years, they could no longer read Yanai in the original form. So these books, beautiful books, thrown away. I mean, well, carefully placed in a synagogue storeroom. And we have pages from this Maksarim of the underscripts and, you know, and over uh, um, uh, the, the Yanai written out, um, and then over the top of that, another overscript of a child writing Hebrew letters, right? Big Hebrew letters all over this beautiful book of Yanai. And it's a medieval child. It's a Jewish child from the you know, 11th century or the 12th century. Why is he being allowed to do this to this book? Because the book had no value at this stage. They could no longer read the poetry of Yanai, despite how beautiful it was. But the Jewish community loved writing. You know, every child had to learn how to read. And to learn how to read, children wrote. They wrote incessantly at school. They copied the alphabet, the alphabet. They copied in their kud. They copied some prayers. And then they copied the book of Vayikra. And so we have hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts of Vayikra, more than any other biblical book in the collection, written in every kind of handwriting, from handwriting of sort of, I don't know, five-year-old children up to, you know, expert scribes. And so we've got Vayikra, you know, with, with spellings spelt every which way, you know, Elohav, instead of being written Yudvav, Elohav with a, a bet at the end, vet, yeah? Like, terrible spelling, you know, but, but, but you know, if you're a kid learning how to write, that's the, that's the kind of mistake you make. Um, and so what the Geniza really, and, and you know, fundamentally why we have the Geniza is, is two things. One is the availability of writing materials in the Islamic world. You wouldn't have a Geniza from the same period in Byzantium because they didn't have paper. They were part of the Christian world. The Jews of Byzantium, they could write, but they didn't have the same convenient access to writing materials. They would have had to use parchment. Parchment would be expensive. In Egypt, from the 10th century, they have paper. Paper is cheap, cheaper than parchment. So the availability of cheap writing materials, people made their own ink. They made their own pens from reeds. Um, they cut, you know, cut reeds. Um, they mixed their own ink. Um, and they bought paper in the market. And the paper was produced from, um, in Egypt, mostly from secondhand clothes. There isn't enough wood in Egypt. They have to import lots of wood for furniture and things. So they don't have spare wood to make paper from. So they, it's a product of the second-hand clothing industry. They take old clothes, they pulp them, they mix them with glue, and they dry them like paper. And that's why we have you know, this, this kind of paper that looks a bit, it's sort of very floppy kind of paper because it's made from flax and cotton and wool and even rabbit fur. So, so the two reasons why we have the Geniza, apart from the sacred imperative that you must preserve holy writings, um, are availability of writing materials and the ability and will to write. All Jewish children, all Jewish male children, but the evidence from the Geniza is, is girls as well, must be able to read the Torah. And to, do, to learn how to do that at school, not everyone has a book at school to read from. We have evidence in the Geniza that people shared books. Um, one, there's a very famous letter in the Geniza where a, a, a man writes to his, his wife telling her to remember while he's traveling, he's traveling in the Egyptian Delta, um, to remember to teach their child how to read a book from all four sides, from upside down and sideways. Because if he's at school and he's sitting around, you know, a book, if he's upside down in relation to it, if he can't read upside down, he won't get an education. So he has to be able to read upside down and sideways. So because there weren't so many books for them to copy from, they wrote their own, you know, everyone copied out. That's how they learned how to read. Um, and we can see evidence of that because we have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pieces of paper of Jewish children's writing of Hebrew from the earliest to, you know, advanced students. Um, and because they all learned how to read, to, to write as a byproduct of learning how to read, when they grew up, they were literate in a way that the Christian community definitely wasn't because in Christianity generally in that period, you were not even encouraged to read the Bible because priests read it to you and explained it to you. And if you did read it, you read it in a foreign language, Latin, for instance, you know, if you were in a Christian European country. Um, 
that you know it was actually illegal for a long period of time to to um, translate the Bible into a vernacular language. Um, Islam as well tendency is to memorize and recite rather than to to read in the same way. And so Jews at the sort of the sort of the top of the pecking order of literacy. Most Jewish people well, for any education could read and write. Then came Muslims and then, you know, or Christian monks and then, then ordinary Christians and Muslims at the bottom. And that's why we have the Geniza, because they had the opportunity to write and they had an ability to write. In addition, they had a will to write, because as I said, it is the duty of people, if they can in their lifetime, to write a Bible. Dr. Uh, Alf, uh, wait, maybe we take advantage of being uh, physically here and take a look on these manuscripts, how they look like physically. Yeah, certainly. One of the most beautiful items that many people have seen in the Geniza is this, which is a children's exercise, uh, it's a, a children's Hebrew primer, so for a child learning to write Hebrew, this is the first book that they would use. And if, if, if you look at it and compare it to the other manuscripts around it, you can see it's very different because it's colourful. Uh, most of our Geniza manuscripts are black ink on brown paper. This is multicoloured ink on parchment, on, on cloth. Because it's on parchment, it's old, so it's at least at least 11th century and, and possibly earlier. Um, but the fact it's coloured is because children are supposed to use this book and, you know, children do need something that's, you know, going to attract their attention when they're in school learning boring Hebrew alphabet. I mean, that is, you know, what the, the, the facts of life, as it were. And but what you have here is very Jewish symbols, the Menorah, the Magen David, um, and then the Hebrew consonants with the different vowels underneath. And this is the very first writing exercises they will do. Before they go on to write Vayikra and so on, they will learn how to write the different letter shapes and they will write the vowels. And, be, and they do that solely so they can read the Torah. But the result is, of course, that they can then thereafter always write Hebrew. So like Moses Maimonides, when they come to write in Arabic, they naturally prefer to write it in Hebrew characters rather than using Arabic letters. And if you look, this is the sort of exercise that the children produce based on these books. So this is not a book to copy from, this is the child's exercise that they've produced. And it's, I think you would say that's a more advanced student, right? it's not the, the first. If you came to me, you know, 10 years ago and said, what's the most exciting thing? I probably would have said Bibles and so on. But now if you come to me, I will say something completely different because we've been working on it ever since. And it's not just us here in Cambridge. In fact, it's, you know, we're a tiny um, group compared to the wider world of people who are now working on the Geniza. Um, because the Geniza was digitized 10, 15 years ago. Um, very generous man in Canada gave money to digitize the whole collection. Um, and so we, our whole Cambridge collection is now available on the internet and consequently Geniza research has exploded around the world because people can sit at home and just sort through manuscripts and find interesting things and that's exactly what's now happening. So we have a colleague, colleague from, from Spain, Professor Delgado, we know him as Pepe, um, he's been working on putting together a book of Spanish documents, so documents from Al-Andalus that are in the Cairo Geniza because a lot of Jews from Al-Andalus either sent letters to Egypt because they had a strong cultural and trading uh, economic links, or they actually, like Judah Levi, um, Judah Levi, they, they actually travelled to Egypt, um, so their documents ended up in Egypt and, in, and eventually ended up in the Kyrianese. So we have lots of documents from Al-Andalus, um, and very early ones, you know, so 11th century and so on. Um, and uh, among those documents are some of the most famous figures of Jewish history. So Andalusians who end up in Egypt, Judah Halevi and Moses Maimonides being the two, you know, the two that everyone would name. But there are many, many others, of course. Um, um, but in compiling this collection of documents relating to Al-Andalus, our colleague Pepe um, looked at a manuscript that we had published years ago. And it's what we call a glossary. So um, because the Geniza society was multilingual and because it was multi-ethnic, as in Jews came from many parts of the Jewish world, there was sometimes a need for them to translate vocabulary so that they could understand each other. All Jews knew Hebrew, obviously they prayed in the Middle Ages, they read the sources, so Hebrew and Aramaic, well, you know, it was the responsibility of every educated person to know these. Um, but if they didn't come from the Islamic world, then they wouldn't necessarily be Arabic speakers or Persian speakers if they came from, the, from far in the East. Um, and especially in the 12th century, following the Crusades and what the Crusaders did in Europe, 
we find in Cairo a lot of Jews coming from Christian lands. Uh, and so we have a lot of figures popping up from southern France, northern Spain, Ashkenaz generally, in Egypt. And they start to leave um, their documents in the Cairo Geniza record. And so in looking through these documents, um, we found a glossary of words in Judeo-Arabic, so Arabic in Hebrew characters, which is the usual way that the Jews of the, of the Geniza world of the Middle Ages wrote their Arabic, because they all learned how to write Hebrew at school, but they spoke Arabic, Arabic was their first language, Hebrew was their first written language, they put the two together and you get Judeo-Arabic. So it's a word list in Judeo-Arabic of relatively common words, like meat, bread, black, white, and underneath it were words in what we identified when we first published it years ago, my colleague um, uh, Dr. Afi Shiftiel published it, um, as words in a unknown Romance language, so Spanish, Italian, a Romance language of some kind. He published that, it was fine, it was nice. Um, here was a, a list for someone who was possibly, you know, arriving in Egypt and needed to understand basic words to live, you know, how to buy bread, you know, how to describe colours, that kind of thing. Um, but it was only when my colleague Pepe was looking at it recently that he pointed out what should have been obvious to us, well, it ridiculously wasn't obvious to us, but should have been, that the whole document is in Moses Maimonides' handwriting. So it's in the Rambam's handwriting, which we know really well, because we have documents signed by him, whole letters so signed He by wrote him. the document. He wrote it. He wrote this list. So this list is, is the first time ever we have evidence of Moses Maimonides writing a language other than Hebrew or Arabic, right? He wrote most of his works in Arabic, in Judeo-Arabic mostly. Um, he obviously wrote the Mishneh Torah and other things in Hebrew. You know, he was obviously a master of both languages. He, he had had a good education. He could write Arabic script too. So we do have examples of him writing Arabic as well as Judeo-Arabic. But we have, never got, we have never had any examples of him writing a European language. And so what this word list is, probably, and my colleague Pepe is now arguing, is that Maimonides wrote all the words in Arabic, and these were words obviously he used in everyday life. And he was trying to remember words from his life back in Al-Andalus from the Romance language spoke, spoken by the common people of Al-Andalus. So the Spanish dialect that was spoken in addition to Arabic. So the kind of words that he would have known if he'd gone to the market, right, to talk to the peasants, you know, to buy food or whatever. He was trying to remember that. And because he couldn't, he was probably asking people who were now coming from northern Spain, southern France, for help. As a result, so the word, so if you look, there's like aswad, right, black in Arabic, and the word under it is negro, right, yeah. Um, um, but in some cases, the words are not obvious in Spanish, and so it's what seems to have happened, and sometimes the, because he, he uses nikud as well, and sometimes nikud is not what we would expect. So what's quite, quite likely is happening is that some of his informants are giving him different dialects of, the, of romance. So it's a kind of mixed picture that he's getting. So what we have is important for a number of reasons. One, it's by Moses Maimonides, you know, the greatest Jewish thinker of the Middle Ages. Um, it's the first time we have evidence that he actually knew any Spanish. You know, we, you could assume he did because he grew up in Spain, but you, you can't be sure because he lived very much in an Islamic, Jewish Islamic environment, learnt Arabic, you know, read all his books in Arabic and so on. But also it's some of the earliest and most important attested vocabulary for a now lost Romance language, because that, that, the, the language of Al-Andalus disappeared after the reconquest, the, you know, when, it, when it, the Christians took back Spain, that language spoken in Al-Andalus just disappeared, and you know, northern, the northern Spanish, whatever, took over. So that is the kind of Geniza in a nutshell. It's vitally important to, to people who are interested in the history of Judaism, the figures of Judaism, Jewish studies generally, but also, it turns out to be extremely interesting on the social history of the movement of Jews around the Mediterranean in this period, 12th to 13th century. And it gives us linguistic information that we don't have from, from hardly any other source. So, I mean, that's you know, just in, a, in, in one document shows quite what the Geniza can do. And that was purely by chance discovered literally a month or two months ago by my colleague Pepe, who suspected it was by Maimonides and, you know, sent an email to to me and to my, to my Israeli colleague, Dr. Amir Ashur, who was here, uh, who, no, who he was in Israel at the time, but you know, he asked me to go and check the manuscript. We checked it together and yes, it's definitely my monetes. How did we not know that? It's, we know his handwriting so well. This is the Rambam one. Um, and if you look, so, so um, for instance, here you have um, in Hebrew characters, so you have laham, which is, is, is meat, in Arabic, yeah, obviously in, in, in Hebrew it's bread, lechem, 
but in Arabic it's meat. And underneath it, again, in the Ramban's handwriting, especially you can see the way he writes his kuf, which is very like the Rambam, it says carne. So, you know, carne in, in Spanish, meat. Yeah, carne is Spanish. Yeah. Latin word, yeah. And so, and what you have here are all of these sort of everyday words for, you know, and, and in some cases he doesn't have a Spanish word because he doesn't know the word. So, you know, death and so on, he doesn't have a word for. Um, but here, yeah, so here you have aswad and negro. Um, but you can see on this, on, on, on the right hand side, he doesn't have Spanish words for any of these. He doesn't know the, the words for them. Showing that, that, you know, he had an imperfect memory for the language that he might have known, you know, when he was young. Now, if you ask, how do we know this is his handwriting? Well, the, the most famous discovery of the Rambam that was made from the Karaganiza was this letter written by him that was published in relatively early days of Geniza research. And this is a whole letter in his handwriting, and it's a letter of introduction. So um, uh, it's introducing a man who has arrived from Morocco and he's gonna settle in Egypt. And he knows Maimonides, so Maimonides has written him a letter of introduction to carry with him to the community where he's going to live so that he can get help from the Jewish community to pay the jizya poll tax that he has to pay to the Islamic authorities. And this one is unusual because it's signed with Moses Maimonides' full name, Moshe Berabi Maimun Zatzal, because his father at this stage is dead. Moshe Berabi Maimun. And that is his characteristic handwriting, the way he writes the final hay, this loopy final hay, the way he joins up the shin and the hay, and the mem and the shin and the hay is very characteristic of the, the Sephardi Andalusian handwriting that Maimonides has. When Maimonides arrives in Egypt, no one else writes like this. People write in Egypt, they write this square Hebrew, a bit like the Dead Sea Scrolls. They don't join up letters. When Maimonides arrives, he, he has this Andalusian style of flowing Hebrew writing, which becomes fashionable. And you find many more examples of it after him. So because we recognize his handwriting from that, if you compare the two manuscripts, although in this letter, you know, he is writing carefully because it's a letter of introduction. And in the other one, it's probably something for his own use. But you can see that the handwriting is the same. And once you recognize the Rambam's handwriting, you can find it all over the Karaganiza. So here, this is a responsum. So this is a she'ela and a tshuva. The she'ela is here. You can see in the very black ink, this is the original she'ela to the Rambam, written in Judeo-Arabic. Um, it says, you know, what does the honorable, um, holy, you know, great Rabbeinu Adonainu Moshe Harav Agadol by Israel Sanhedra Rabba Yechid Hador. Um, all of the, the kind of um, uh, glorious titles that my Maimonides has, what does he say about Fi, Reuven, um, who had a nephew, and um, the nephew got married, had a child, the nephew died, and a year later the child died. Now the man would like to marry his nephew's widow. Is it acceptable? And I believe the, the, the point here, why it was a, why they had to write to the Rambam to ask for an answer to this was because there was a child that complicates the issue. But the fact the child had died means technically there isn't a child anymore in the relationship. So some people would have argued, yes, it's fine for them to get married. Other people have argued, no, the presence of a child means they can't get married. So they asked my Maimonides. So then the answer in the, in the Rambam's own handwriting is the bottom in Judeo-Arabic, beginning al-Jawab, meaning, meaning hat the, the the answer. They can get married, wa katabam Moshe, signed Moses. Um, he doesn't explain why they can get married. He doesn't explain how he, he reaches this opinion. You know, does he get it from the Mishnah or the Talmud or, or from other sources? He doesn't say. He just says they can do it. Um, with a, the kind of authority that suggests, you know, it's, a, it's suggestive of the authority he had in Egypt when he wrote this, that he could get away with just saying something like that and people that's would, you know, a, wave that and say, that's fine. Amazing. So earlier, you were asking what is the oldest fragment in the collection. I said, you know, the earliest things are um, 
uh, palimpsest manuscripts that can date from the 5th or 6th century. The earliest sort of purely Jewish items are Torah scrolls that are probably from the 7th or 8th century. Uh, but that's because we've carbon dated or someone has carbon dated um, examples of these and can tell us that. If you want to know what's the earliest thing that we have that we can say for sure, then it's this item, which is a copy of a Bible. So it's a, it's a copy of the Tanakh, produced in, um, no, sorry, I'll put it on there, see it? Um, produced in Iran. And we can say what date it's written because it's the end of the book of Nehemiah. And at the end of the book, the scribe has written a little colophon here saying, so he says, Katav Yosef ben Nimorad, like a form of Nimrod. So Joseph ben Nimrod has written this, Bishnat Alpha Umatan ve Chamesha Sashanin, in the year 1215, and then he says, in the town of, and the town is a town in Persia that's now in Iran. So in the year 1215, now he doesn't say what system of calendar he's using, which is quite common for them to say according to the creation, according to the destruction of the temple, according to the, the exile of King Yehoahin, or according to, to the Seleucid era. But 1215, almost certainly he means the Seleucid era, so he means Lishtarot. So you have to take away 311 or 312 from 1215 and you get 903 or 904. So this is the earliest dated medieval Hebrew manuscript in the world, 903 to 4. What's interesting about it is the original shape of this, it's, if you, if you think of Bibles now, if you think of the Leningrad Codex and the Aleppo Codex, these are tall books like that. But this book is long like this. And if you were to sort of say, well, what does that remind you of? In actual fact, it reminds you of the Quran, that they, the Quran manuscripts they, they produced in the Abbasid era. And that may be important for the history of the book in Judaism because what's in, What's, what's interesting about, about the codex, the book, in the, his, in, the history, in the history of Judaism, is that Jews were very late to adopt the book. It's quite well known that Christians adopted the book very early in their religion. The book was already known in ancient Roman Greece, although not widely used, they still use scrolls. But Christians adopted the form of the book for their gospels, for their Bible. And probably as a result, Jews didn't choose to accept the book. They decided they would carry on using scrolls for their religious works. And that was partly to make sure there was a clear separation in the early days of Christianity, a clear separation between Judaism and Christianity, scrolls and books. It was a way of distinguishing what were at times slightly um, porous boundaries between the two religions. But it was also this sense that Judaism was all about the scroll. You know, the, the scroll is mentioned in the Bible, it is, it is the way that you read the scriptures. The, the Kidvei Kodesh should be written on, you know, a Megillah. Um, however, when Islam comes along and uh, Muslims invade the Holy Land, there is a, almost a sort of messianic sense in Judaism that the world has changed. The reign of Christianity is coming to an end. And here are people who are, you know, a different religion, but essentially drawn from the same sources, who have a more sympathetic understanding of, the Jewish, of Jewish history and their place in the world. And these people, the Muslims, read their scriptures from a book. So if the Muslims can do it, if we adopt the book, it doesn't mean we're like the Christians. <laughs> so at this stage, so say from the, uh, it's not, we're not exactly clear when, when uh, Jews start using books for things like the Tanakh, um, but from an early, early, early period after the arrival of the Muslims, so after the seventh, eighth century, and this is, you know, early 10th century, very end of the 9th century, um, the form of the book that they've adopted is essentially the form of the book as used by Muslims. So this, this if, it, if, you, if you didn't see that it was written in Hebrew, or Aramaic and Hebrew, you would think that this was a Quran from a distance just because of the shape of it. But it's not. It's a, a thoroughly Jewish book. It's just they've modelled it on the style used by the wider Islamic world. And that's something we, the Geniza sort of teaches us and reminds us of that you know, the Jews were part of a larger world, an Islamic world. And while um, they, you know, the, one of the elements of Judaism is conservatism, is preserving ancient traditions, it's also a surprisingly porous religion of its own, and it adopts from the world around it. 
which is why you know the Jews of Islamic lands had ended up with very different customs to the Jews of, of, of European lands, the Ashkenazi. Dr. Uh, Al Sprait, uh, thank you very much. A uh, pleasure. It's uh, very exciting actually to be here near all this uh, original text, which is uh, like exists for more than a thousand years.